so this is the nnfi uh, recommendation shock guidelines uh, which we published last year and uh, these are the my colleagues who worked on it and um, it's it's really a good guideline it's a very extensive document to see uh, and refer although uh, some of them are consensus made statement but you know we went through a uh, rigorous sort of practical questions which needs to be addressed and uh, and again uh, taking in mind the important outcomes which are like critical outcomes uh, like mortality uh, morbidity etc and also important outcomes you know we want to have a shorter duration of hospitalization icu and other serious events and all those things so based on that basically we covered now this one was very nicely covered by dr gaurav uh, one thing i have to add he he did mention about the uh, specifically the uh, normogram so for less than 32 weeks there is a german neonatal network normograms is there uh, which is this slide uh, which is there and the reference is there in the uh, nnf document so as you can see uh, you don't have to uh, you know uh, basically there are normograms in first 72 hours which are, have been published and there we are saying that as you can see for a 26 weeker your range is 21 to 28 so don't get scared if your blood pressures are 22 23 24 that's where you know a lot of time people are finding difficult uh, to wait and they jump to start and then the blood pressure shoots and there is a risk of um, IVH occurring in that. And that's why we looked at this question specifically. If you allow the permissible hypotension in first 24 hours. And I'll come to that slide. But German neutral network is the normogram to follow for less than 32 weeks in first 72 hours. And for the older uh, babies, there are Zubro's normograms. Okay. Which are there again available. You can search and uh, put it in your NICU. And as a reference point, these things are already mentioned. And again, preferably to use IBP wherever possible. Invasive blood pressure is superior wherever possible than an IBP. And uh, I think this also Dr. Gaurav nicely explained uh, a combination, the Clohati slide, which he mentioned. But uh, I think uh, although all, all the studies and even we talk about means, means, means equal to gestation or means as per the nomograms, it is very important to get into your head about diastolics and systolic bp separately and if you start observing that it will make your uh, understanding a bit more easier that uh, whenever the blood pressures were normal and things have changed or mean has dropped first thing to you uh, you see is what is dropped actually is it the systolic has dropped or the diastolic has dropped or both have dropped both have dropped and then the etiology is based on what actually has dropped so if diastolics is mainly uh, controlled by the preload so your volumes and also after load reduction so if you have preload is less if you have less fluid in the body uh, like shock blood loss everything all those uh, things which will cause the fluid loss or preload issue will cause diastolic blood pressure okay and after load reduction like in sepsis, NEC, and PDA specifically also, you see start uh, the afterload drops because there's a puff off to the aorta. So diastolic blood pressure is the first thing to drop. So in a preterm baby, means is dropping. You see that probably diastolic is dropping. You know that ductus is open probably. Baby doesn't look septic. So you know you have to address it accordingly. Similarly, if the systolic is dropping, probably heart is not functioning pretty properly, uh, 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 properly or there is too much afterload. Like sometime in transition circulation, PPHN or uh, post ligation, again, Dr. Gaurav explained nicely the sudden increase in the afterload uh, or hypothermia, all those things causing increase afterload will cause systolic blood pressure to drop. And sometimes the contractility might be low and there the systolic blood pressure might drop. Okay, so your cardiomyopathies, asphyxias, um, adrenal cortical insufficiency. So again, get into this habit of... Uh, looking at systolic diastolic blood pressure separately and uh, then again the management what he described was um, which will help you but again in nutshell simply you know that if you want if your issue is contractility you need dobutamine or adrenaline if you have a too much afterload you need a vasodilator like milidone or an ionodilator like dobutamine if you have a preload issue volume issue just give volumes or blood transfusion if you have decreased afterload so there's a drop in SVR, 
then you give uh, vasopressors like dopamine norepinephrine or vasopressin so like that you decide so i and uh, important in newborns is no shock comes straight away you know so although we have made a recommendations for uh, different types of shock which dr gaurav nicely highlighted although the in newborns shock is quite mixed so you might have a baby with a meconium aspiration with sepsis and pphn or you might have a preterm with sepsis and pda so you know it's always a mixed shock or there might be cardiac dysfunction in a baby with sepsis so you want to support the heart but if you increase too much after load that might be detrimental so again as i said these uh, recommendations are good for starting points but it's always good to take issue uh, decision based on echo and based on what findings you have and uh, then it helps you to you know better decision making and baby will tell you if your decision is correct baby will show response and if your decision is not correct baby will show deterioration okay no routine bolus says then coming to the question so i think this he is nicely explained so i would not go through again uh, and uh, just uh, if i take like one take home for every drug is uh, the um, norepinephrine a good vasoconstrictor epinephrine good inotropy blood plus vasoconstriction dopamine good vasoconstrictor dobutamine good inotropy so good contraction but it's an ino dilator so it it contracts but it also vaso dilate so sometimes the blood pressure can drop with dobutamine and then vasopressin pure vasoconstrictor but different pathway and then melinone is a lisotrope so so again uh, as again dr gaurav nicely explained so you have to think what you need to achieve if you want to achieve vasoconstriction so you are vaso dilated then your drug choices are norepinephrine dopamine and vasopressin and if you have issues with contractility your choices are epinephrine dobutamine and probably melinone uh, to help the contractility so i think that's how what you want to achieve that's a kind of a combination of drugs you use and this is again one slide often i used to share with my residents so dopamine is like your you know these are the avengers which come for your help so dopamine is like uh, you help it's a first kind of a, a it, it squeezes tightly so it is a pure vasoconstrictor epinephrine is like your uh, uh, iron man it has got multiple actions so it has got beta 1 action alpha 1 action so again supports the heart also causes vasoconstriction then your norepinephrine is your uh, captain america so again it's a kind of a vasoconstrictor and loki is your milrinone specifically again supporting the heart and causing the uh, afterload reduction so vasodilatation and uh, your dobutamine is like thor it just uh, mainly is the heart you know beta 1 squeezing the heart like it strikes the heart strong so it supports the heart but can cause vasodilatation and dopamine has uh, again nicely dr gaurav mentioned different different ranges or different actions are there but mainly it's again vasoconstrictor smaller doses renal vasodilatation etc is controversial but yeah we always talk about it but we have stopped using that low dose uh, this thing so mainly it's a kind of a vasoconstriction some action on the heart but dopamine is a, a one drug which is so well studied in newborn like there are lots of styles so whenever we were fishing for evidence we were ending up uh, using dopamine uh, like we were getting dopamine uh, for many of the questions however in real practice now we are slightly moving away from dopamine and uh, using more of epi nor epi and all those things so uh, again in septic shock uh, we got dopamine as a drug of choice because there are no studies for uh, 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 for other agents in uh, sepsis but if you look at pediatric and adults people have already moved towards norepinephrine as a drug of choice for sepsis so we are also conducting one rct in wadia on norepinephrine versus dopamine but um personally i think last few years we have moved to norepinephrine instead of dopamine for septic shock so that's something for to take away so this is the one i was talking about we said n n n f dopamine or epinephrine but you can consider norepinephrine and now uh, yeah this is the one thing again highlight so if a baby is in first 24 hours 
and you have a isolated hypotension what does that mean the isolated hypotension baby is clinically looking fine you are looking at the baby he looks well he looks pink and perfused baby is in room air uh, like maybe ventilated but in a very low settings and uh, only thing that the number is less 27 weaker blood pressure is 24 mean is 24 then you get into dilemma what should we do your resident fellow keeps asking you sir blood pressure is dropping what to do so we looked at this specific question and uh, there is some evidence not very strong but the recommendation we came up with that in first 24 hours where the things are transitioning the isolated hypotension can be observed and may not be treated unless it persists but severe isolated hypotension but if the blood pressure stop uh, draws 5 millimeters more than the uh, corresponding gestation then probably you know it's really pushing so 26 weaker your bp drops to 21 and below then probably you know you're worried and you want to address it so that's kind of a recommendation we are making but beyond 24 48 hours when the transition has happened and if the hypotension is still persisting these are the nomograms i already covered then probably it's clinicians bed discussion sometime we are still bold and want to wait and see uh, but uh, but you know uh, it can be considered to treat it's not wrong to consider treatment because you know the blood pressure is low and you want to maintain the adequate blood perfu uh, pressures to maintain the cerebral perfusion so you know that 30 is sort of considered as a kind of a ballpark for many preterms so that's why many clinicians would like to come closer to 30 so that's something a subjective decision and there are no strong recommendations for that and beyond 30, 72 hours if it's persisting there is no strong evidence but you can consider treating because baby has mostly transitioned it out if the blood pressure is still low maybe you need to address it and look at if the there is underlying pd or something else you need to treat um yeah so transition circulation he already covered epinephrine might be a good drug and steroids so that's uh, that is where the question was asked when should we consider steroids so we quite rigorously studied this question and uh, the uh, idea was uh, again you know there is so much uh, differences and we even in fact asked a lot of clinicians and we looked at the pediatric guidelines how do you define the catecholamine and refractory shock or a fluid refractory shock and there is no clear cut consensus on it and if you look at AIMS and PGI guidelines, many times they will say go to 10, 20, 20 of dopa, dobutamine, and then you consider steroid. So we uh, we basically took a median cutoff and saw if the evidence is supporting us. So we used vasoactive inotropic score, which is a kind of a score depending on the doses of various drugs. So a score more than 10 was our cutoff. And we saw that, you know, if the cutoff is about 10 or below 10 whether we get any consensus so we found some consensus that if the vi score is more than 10 so if you're on dopamine of more than 10 or dobutamine more than 10 or ap more than 0.1 nor ap more than 0.1 and vaso more than 0 0.001 and then you are now thinking of in either increasing the dose of the first inotrope or you're thinking to add the second inotrope then that's the time you add the steroid and that is actually shown to be beneficial and that's what we called it as early hydrocortisone and if you do late it is shown to be late is uh, shown to be basically uh, associated with higher mortality so if you're giving better you give early if you're late it's too late you end up that you will lose the baby and hydrocort also takes a lot of time to act so uh, you need to give early is better and the suggested dose which we have published is 1 milligram per kilo followed by 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilo every 8 to 12 hours. So this is the dose and uh, uh, and in preterm you tend to give a higher dose 2 milligram followed by 1 milligram every 6 to 8 hours. And again there are a lot of units in UK moving towards uh, early hydrocortisone because you know a lot of the preterms have that uh, this catecholamine insufficiency. So you might... Uh, give them uh, hydrocort proactively uh, and it often helps these babies you know especially when they're on inotrope and they're still not responding adding early hydrocort might work so